part of us now uh, who are actually living in Canada. But sure, nonetheless, why don't you um, why don't you tell us where you are this morning if you're anywhere different, or even if you're at home, sure, tell us uh, where we are. See what the the spread is this morning of people. But wherever you are th- this summer. Would you please make sure to take time to relax? And of course, our three R's, reflect and recreate and recover. Uh, Janice and I are already trying to do some of that. We're trying to be a wee bit less active out there on our WhatsApp groups and everything else, trying to withdraw a little bit to take some time for those things. And uh, after this Sunday, we're going to be taking uh, the next couple of Sundays off between now and the end of July, uh, just to make sure that we've got a wee bit of that time as well. So I hope everybody's trying to do that. Whatever your working life has been, whatever your family life has been, uh, whatever all that is that you've had to reshape around you, would you make sure that there's some time for some of those other things this morning? Uh, Not just this morning, but in the weeks that lie ahead. We could turn this summer into something that's a much more positive experience than maybe the last few months have been. I'm kind of imagining a spa resort for the heart and the mind and the soul over these months. Now, you're going to learn a new word today, later on in the service. Well, no, actually, you're not going to learn a new word. You're you're maybe going to have a, a word that you've known for many years, maybe redefined, reshaped by the where it came from what the word actually meant and I think it's a word that you'll enjoy later on in the service and you'll it'll give you a fresh sweet thought about July and August I think and something that we can ponder on and maybe take to heart a wee bit but anyway what's all this set up now you wouldn't believe how long this took me to figure out how to do this and I've had to dismantle one of the slide robes in one of our bedrooms to do this so look I can I can shake this one. And I actually don't know, as you're watching me, if you're looking at a reflection or if you're looking at the real me. And there's no point in me putting my hand up because, as you can see, that goes off into the distance. You can see the, the, the lights in the ceiling going off into the distance. Do you know what? They go on forever. There's infinity there. Or eternity, if you line the mirrors up right. And... That's what reflecting is about. Well, we all know what reflection is because we look at ourselves in mirrors every day of our lives. So we see ourselves reflected. But it's when you look past your reflection, especially if you can do it like this and put up two mirrors facing each other, you realise that you can see backwards. That's what reflecting is about. It's about seeing what's behind us. And I'm not sure if this is behind me or if this is behind me at the minute. But whatever it is, I can see way backwards. And I can't change what's behind me in life. But what I can do is I can take that and take out of it what will help me go forwards in life. And maybe put away some of the things that won't help me go forwards in life. Because this reflection when you put these mirrors like this allows me to see as far into the future and forwards as I can see into the past and into what's behind. And that's part of what we're trying to do this summer, is allowing what has happened to us to not just shape and dictate what happens in front of us, but to help us decide how we would like to be in the future. So we'll be doing a little bit of that later on today when we we listen to another letter uh, written by someone. I'll introduce that person uh, in a few minutes, but uh, that is what we're trying to do. And that's part of the reason for all of this. And I thought we could start this morning by sharing some words together that we haven't used in quite a while, but they'll be familiar words to you. And they're words that help us reflect a little bit on our past, maybe our immediate past, and allow us to bring them to God and ask him for some healing for what is there as we look forwards to what is here. Let's take a few moments of quietness as we prepare for this moment Uh, of reflecting back on our own lives. The words of the prayer will come up on the screen. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour 
in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We're truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. If you know these words, please do join in. My sins, they are many, his mercy is more. My sins, they are many, his mercy is more. My sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Let's carry straight on by singing together a song that we've done once or twice over the last couple of months. A song just affirming that we know that we're counting on God for everything about our lives and our faith and our hope and our future. Ruth and Paul, would you lead us please? Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Paul. As I get closer to some time off, uh, I, I'm becoming more and more conscious of how much everyone else is doing. Uh, did you know that Ruth is head of maths and has been acting vice principal in a large secondary school in our city? 
and as well as that doing music for us here on Sunday mornings and those evenings where she and Paul have led us in worship and two teenagers at home and Paul at home and that would be a challenge in itself I imagine. But thanks to both of them, Paul and Ruth, uh, for just the time and energy you've put into everything. Do you know that Paul is our constant organiser, coordinator, health and safety guru? He's the person we go to when we want to know what are we allowed to do? How many people are you allowed in? How do you open the door? Uh, how do you get that food out there? All those things. Paul has masterminded in behind the scenes everything that's been going on with us. And could I tell you, we're in incredibly safe hands. So thank you to them. Now, today's reflection, today's letter to a post-lockdown church, Michael Wardlow. He's a person of great wisdom, isn't he? And a person of very little hair. But I don't think wisdom and lack of hair are necessarily related. But I do admire in Michael something, because I've known him for many years, something that is the wisdom that comes from his words isn't just uh, something that's going on in his head, but in actual fact, it's something that is lived out. It's applied all the time, both to his own life, the life of his family, uh, but his working life and the contribution that he has made to our wider society in this city and beyond. Uh, so I love the fact that this wisdom is grounded in real life. So Michael, would you please feel free to stretch our minds and our souls today? Thank you. Today's reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 29. It's a letter to the Israelites in exile in Babylon. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come for you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Amen. It's my privilege to read the second letter in the series that the church is doing on reflections on the lockdown. In the past three months, we've faced a huge change. We've been taken from the place we knew well, and have had to adopt a new culture and new ways of doing things. In short, we have arrived in a new place. In this new place, let's call it lockdown, we live socially distanced lives, with many of us shielding. All of us have had to negotiate this new world in new ways. In this new place, the things we once took for granted, like hugging friends and family, attending church and weddings and baptisms and funerals, visiting hospitals and homes, have been severely limited. It is perhaps not surprising that even the word we use about this place, lockdown, resonates with the idea of imprisonment and freedoms lost. The very fact that we talk about social distancing rather than physical distancing reflects the consequences of this new culture we find ourselves in. For in this new place, we must follow instructions rigorously for the good of all of us. Now, this plays out at many levels. In shops where we have to clean our hands on entry, clean the trolleys with disinfectant before we queue for provisions. And once inside, we must follow the arrows and stop at designated lines when we're about to make our contactless payments. And when we get back home, we carefully clean and wipe our purchases, with special attention being paid to fresh fruit and perishables. Clothing, if we've been fortunate enough to buy some, we hang it up for a few days until it's ready to try on. 
In this new place, we have had to learn a new language and a new vocabulary. Words such as social distancing, the new normal, R factors, furloughing, blended learning and PPE. We now even know what constitutes essential work and travel. In this new place, media has become our prime source of information of the outside world. In the early days, we sat glued to the radio or television to listen to the latest update on infections and deaths from COVID-19, a term used of this virus that we'd come to fear. Now we follow the trends on a 24-7 basis on our digital dashboards. In this new place, things move rapidly and rules change quickly, sometimes before we've had time to embrace the old ones, let alone recall what used to be normal. It's not surprising that with this constantly changing context has come some confusion. For example, how can all our children go back to school while socially distancing at two metres? In looking after children informally, are we to retain two metres as the normal distance with one metre only when essential? And an increasingly popular though first world question, should we arrange our holidays? In this place, the role of the expert has become a key component of our everyday life. Now, this raises the question, are there experts whose opinions we should accept uncritically? This issue is important as sometimes definitions are contested. For example, we're told we're led by the science. But what exactly is the science? When it seems to me, at least, that scientists disagree significantly on some key messages. Take, for example, the wearing of face coverings. In this place, how we have lived as people of faith has also changed dramatically. For a long time, we've been unable to come together to worship. And now that we're moving towards being able to meet in smaller numbers, it not be as it once was, for we'll not be able to sing, share coffee, or give each other and receive the sign of the peace. It is important to remind ourselves that God's people have always faced new challenges and therefore it's important that we reflect theologically as well as socially on where we are and what things might look like on the other side of now. About 2,700 years ago, just about the times that the Celts came to Ireland, the ten tribes which made up the northern kingdom of Israel were taken into exile by the Assyrian Empire. It came suddenly and left the Israelites confused with, with the speed in which it happened as well as the new situation they now faced. A few centuries later, and the same fate befell the southern kingdom, when the Babylonian Empire took it away, and, like its northern partner, they faced new and challenging state of existence. Both kingdoms needed to reorient themselves and ask the question, how do we serve God in this new place, when everything they were used to had gone? They faced changes in economy, social structures, religious practice and cultural norms. The temple where God lived had gone. There were no more kings and their God, Yahweh, was reduced to being viewed as a tribal deity, only one God among many in a changing world. Now, when we talk about change, we normally refer to something new happening. But the mystery of transformation more often happens, not when something new begins, but when something old falls apart. The pain of something old falling apart, chaos, invites the soul to listen at a deeper level and sometimes forces the soul to go to a new place. Most of us would never go to new places in any other way. The mystics used many words to describe this chaos. Fire, dark night, death, emptiness, abandonment, trial, the evil one. But whatever it is, it doesn't feel good and it doesn't feel like God. So says Richard Rohr. I would like to suggest that this witnessing of the falling apart of the old, which was the experiences of the Israelites almost 3,000 years ago, is the same experience that we're going through today. And I think, therefore, there are some lessons in these stories about how the children of Israel dealt with their situation, which might help us as we reflect on our position as modern-day exiles. Israel were going along nicely with kings and prophets, and then suddenly an outside power overpowered them, and the whole world that they knew fell apart. The old was taken away, first by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians. The Israelites spent considerable time looking for a theological compass. Where was God in this new place? Their tradition told them that he was worshipped in a building, in a geographical center, in a traditional manner. But they couldn't do that. So in despair, they tried many things, reverting to what they knew best. In short, they attempted a reboot. But that wasn't possible. 
they struggled with the concept of being without what was normal, the temple, the monarchy, the land, asking deep theological questions along the way. Socially, economically, politically and religiously, they were disoriented. They felt aliens in a strange land, a land where they retained a moral and social distance from those who they perceived to be unclean. Then the truth dawned on them. Tradition had limited value. They had to learn a lesson and live in the present as God's people in new ways. They were challenged to settle down and build houses and families, to engage in productive work, agriculture, that they would honour Yahweh before the nations. They realised that the kingdom of God was about reign and not geography, and that God was just as reachable by prayer from Assyria and Babylon as he was from Israel and Judah. They rediscovered God was not limited to a building. They realised that they needed to set aside false spiritual advice as Jeremiah chastened them. The voices and visions of false and immoral prophets who counsel against truth. They learnt that God's promises were eternal and followed, indeed preceded them into the exile. They learned to trust those promises and to ask God to restore their courage and morale. They were forced to look within their own souls and to draw out only that was truly of God. So what are the challenges for us? Well, like the Israelites, we need to understand tradition has limited value. Our ways of doing church have changed through circumstances beyond our control. Our old ways and traditions have been transformed in order for us to live well in this new world. Now, it's not an inferior way of worshipping God. It's a different way. But the essence remains the same. We still come together to worship God and have fellowship with one another and share God's love in an increasingly fearful world. God is just as reachable by prayer here in the lockdown as he was in the parish church in early 2020. Prayer is uniquely personal and needs no physical structure to be effective. And just like the Israelites, we've learned that lesson. We've also learned that God is not limited to a building. His kingdom is about power and not geography. So although we're physically scattered, we find new virtual ways of being together as a church family to support one another. Thanks to all our IT gurus. The Israelites realized that they needed to set aside false spiritual advice. Now for us, this translates into being people who discern. Sadly, some Christian leaders have seen COVID-19 as God's judgment as fake news or even demonic invasion. It's vital we reflect on what's happening within a Christian context, reflecting on scripture and the lessons of church history. Now is not the time to seek definitive answers to the question, why is God allowing this to happen? For me at least, there'll be time on the other side of now for us to do that. They learned that God's promises were eternal. God is still calling us and equipping us to live in this new place, for however long that is. His promises remain the same now as in the past. The virus doesn't diminish either God or his love. We too, like those Israelites, have been forced to look within ourselves, deeply within our souls, and draw out only that which is truly of God, his essence. God is love. But we've learned lessons as well. We're never too old to learn. We have learned the importance of family, fellowship, touch, assembling, presence, spontaneity and freedoms. We reflect on things we took for granted, shopping, food being clean, being close to people, holding people, cuddling people. So, some final reflections. We dare not simply reboot and go back to where we were. As Adrian has said in another place, we should recalibrate, reset our compass for the future and not our past. In my view, there is no new normal. We are in the course of a journey, making new discoveries every day. This is not as good as it gets. We can't settle for that. It will get better. We need to learn together from our wilderness experience about what worked well and what didn't work, what we should keep and what we set aside. There is no harm in admitting we made mistakes, for that's how we learn. We need to remember ultimately that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Listen to Richard Rohr again. We will normally do anything to keep the old thing from falling apart. Yet this is when we need patience and guidance and the freedom to let go instead of tightening our controls and certitudes. While change can force a transformation, spiritual transformation always includes a disconcerting reorientation. It can either help people to find new meaning or it can force people to close down or slowly turn bitter. 
The difference is determined precisely by the quality of our inner life, our practices, our spirituality. Change happens. But transformation is always a process of letting go, living in the confusing, shadowy place for a while. Now, I don't know whether you know the origin of the word saunter. It derives from the Middle Ages when people used to go on pilgrimages to the Holy Land. When they were walking past villages, the inhabitants would call out, where are you going? The answer would be, à la santerre, to the Holy Land. And this then was translated from French into English as santerreurs or saunterers. Now, when we live in this space, for however long that is, I would suggest that we adopt the same approach as those early saunterers, realising that this is holy ground because God is here with us and walks with us and goes before us. So we don't spend our time wishing for a return to the past, rather that we take this opportunity to see this time as one in which we can learn what it is like to live in holy ground as we saunter along, scattered but together. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Wow, nearly speechless. But uh, I told you we would uh, rediscover a word to saunter, to look for that holy ground, to walk in that holy ground. So, someone a few years ago uh, said to me, what could you do if you had no fear? That's a really good question. If we had no fear, could we really push into the things that Michael has been sharing with us there? If we weren't fearful, the courage that that would give us to be able to walk into the holy land, the new ground or whatever that God would want us to be in. We're, go we're going to sing that in a moment. So Michelle, would you get ready? Uh, we're going to sing um, No Longer a Slave to Fear. But I want to pray first because I actually... I actually think these are God moments. God is with us and we're not just watching things and listening to things. We're encountering the living God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, thank you that nothing that we're in today is beyond what you understand and what you're doing and what you're reaching into our world to prepare us for and to help us with. So today, Father, would you pour out your Holy Spirit upon this Beaver Church, scattered as far and wide as we can imagine. Pour your Holy Spirit out upon us. Banish the fears and the anxieties about the future that maybe linger in us, and I know I have them too. Would you banish this fear and bring us into a place of confidence in who you are and in what you're doing among us? Come Holy Spirit, come and move in us as we sit in stillness and either listen or join in with these words. Come Holy Spirit, minister into our hearts and our minds. Michelle, would you lead us no longer a slave to fear?
Thanks, Michelle and Eric and Eva. Now, we're coming to our prayers this morning. On Thursday morning, I had a wee bright idea when we were setting up for the 10.30 gathering uh, one small step down in our own church building there. And there were 22 of us, something like that, there this morning. I know all the names are written in a book, so uh, we, we, we could know exactly who was there. Uh, but I had a wee thought, wouldn't it be good since we're all there, that uh, if we could get the people who are praying this morning for us on Sunday, especially maybe some who don't get to see this every week. So uh, I think they, some of them do get to see it, of course. But uh, I asked for some volunteers and three sound souls offered to do our prayers for this, this morning. So we're, we're going to let them pray. Their names will come up beside them just in case you don't know who they are. But it's wonderful uh, to have the th these three leading us in our prayers today. And at the end of the prayers, I lead us in our Father. So please do join in with that. But let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we move gently into the holiday season, would you help us to reflect on the weeks that have just been part of our lives? Help us to see you in every day that has been lived in fear or anxiety, on our own or with others. Help us to find reasons to give thanks as well. Please help us to consider how our faith felt weak or felt strong. Help us to sustain our newly found enthusiasm for prayer and for supporting one another. Help us as a church to embrace the new things you have been teaching us. Help us as a nation to remember the sacrifice that so many made. Help us to give thanks. Help us to consider what we could do better. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Spirit of healing, for many we have lived through times that have hurt and have left their wounds on us physically, mentally, and relationally. Would you strengthen all those who are still recovering from coronavirus? Would you bring peace and faith to those who have lost loved ones, whether through the virus or any other way? Would you surround with gentleness and comfort those who are feeling anxious or afraid for the future. Would you bring healing to all those whose medical care has been interrupted or delayed? Would you give wisdom to all who have to make decisions that may affect others? Please draw us forwards as a community towards healing and restoration of lost trust and the overcoming of new disagreements. Would you help us to protect and care for those who feel they may be parts of society that are forgotten about or disliked in any way? Spirit of new life and love, may we emerge from this season better able to live as the human family that you have created in perfection and with love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord and Redeemer, we know that you make all things new. Our lives and relationships feel as if they need to be renewed and recreated. As a caterpillar struggles to become a butterfly, would you strengthen us over these weeks of the summer as we struggle to become new again. Lead us to capture afresh your purposes and plans for us as individuals, as families and as church family. We pray too for those who are trying to rebuild and recreate businesses and schools and hospitals and all sorts of things that are part of our daily lives. May we all Rebuild and recreate with wisdom and careful hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our Father, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ken and Fiona and John. Uh, we all loved seeing you there. And it's great to see some faces that maybe we haven't seen as often before. So thank you to them. Now, we're going to finish with our final hymn this morning. And it's a hymn that, uh, oh, it's full of life, full of joy and full of hope and so well known to us all. So let's sing together. Michelle Hudson's, would you like to lead us in Shine, Jesus, Shine? Thank you. That was a good thing. And uh, more than that, full of meaning as well. So we're, we're about to close. I just wanted to encourage you as you go uh, to go on from this place and take a saunter into the summer. Let's saunter through this summer, scattered yet together. See where it takes us. And sauntering in the meaning that Michael shared with us is really quite a safe place to be if it's on holy ground. And yet it's also a terrifying place to be because everyone who ever found themselves on holy ground find themselves with a mission or a task or a call. But that's what we're up for because that's who we are and that's why we're here. So let's pray together. 
Go before us, O Lord. Go before us, O Lord, in this and all our doings with thy most gracious favour. And further us with thy continual help, that in all our works, begun, continued and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name. And finally, by thy mercy, attain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go, saunter in peace and love. Go in peace to love and serve Go in peace and saunter in love. Go in peace and saunter to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm away for a wee saunter and a cup of coffee. Thanks. See you all soon. Bye.